As you know, that declaration calls on the Secretary General to deliver a report on the common agenda, which he will. Uh, this morning, our Deputy Secretary General, Mina Mohammed, arrived in London on a trip to meet senior UK government officials and other stakeholders to discuss efforts towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals and tackling climate change. As you know, the UK will host the next uh, COP meeting in Glasgow in November. Uh, she will uh, be back in the office on Monday. And this morning, the Security Council held its uh, biannual briefing on West Africa and the Sahel. The special representative, the Secretary General and the head of the Office for West Africa and the Sahel, Mahatma Saleh Anadif, stressed to the Council members that the UN system is fully mobilized to ensure development aid efficiently reaches the people of the Sahel through inclusive, sustainable, and people-centered responses. Mr. Anadif said that in the face of persistent farmer herder conflicts across the region, his office continues to co-chair the UN regional working groups on farmer herder issues and conflict prevention. Uh, his full remarks have been shared with you. Also this morning, the Security Council held a private meeting on the situation in Haiti. Um, the special representative, the Secretary General and head of the political office, Helen Lalim, is briefing council members, and she will be speaking to you uh, afterwards in a virtual stakeout. She'll be beamed in here and will um, moderate from here. Uh, if, if it happens in the middle of the briefing, we'll interrupt to take her. Uh, and at 3 p.m. this afternoon, if the day wasn't busy enough, the council will convene in person on a briefing on the ongoing disagreement involving Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan regarding the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam under the agenda Peace and Security in Africa. Uh, there will be two UN briefers. Uh, one is uh, the Special Envoy of the Secretary General for the Horn of Africa, our friend Parfait Onanga Anyanga. Uh, he is expected to stress how more needs to be done given the recent negotiations have yielded little progress as in undeniable that this is a matter of critical importance, that is the dam. Also briefing will be the Executive Director of the UN Environment Program, Inger Anderson. Uh, she will underscore uh, the readiness of the UN system to assist the parties in any way we can. Uh, those remarks will be shared with you around 1.30, 2 o'clock uh, under embargo, both of theirs. Um, you will have noted that uh, last night we issued a statement marking uh, the grim mark of four millionth death due to the COVID-19 virus. In his statement, the Secretary General noted that this tragic toll is more than the population of one out of three countries on Earth. He noted that while vaccines offer a ray of hope, the virus will be outpacing vaccine distribution. Secretary General stressed how millions or more are at risk if the virus is allowed to spread like wildfire. The more it spreads, the more variants we see. Variants are more transmissible, more deadly, and more likely to undermine the effectiveness of the current vaccines. Bridging the vaccine gap requires the greatest global public health effort in history, he said, calling for a global vaccine plan. Also on staying on topic, the World Health Organization today said that Africa has marked its worst pandemic week ever. The virus cases have risen for several consecutive weeks since the start of the third wave in May. During the week uh, ending on July 4th, more than 251,000 new cases were recorded, a 20% increase over the previous week. Uh, they warned that the worst is yet to come with the end of the precipitous rise of in cases still weeks away. WHO said there are signs of progress in the vaccine front, with COVAX deliveries in Africa picking up pace. In the past two weeks, more than 1.6 million doses were delivered, and an additional 20 million doses are expected to arrive soon from the U.S. through COVAX. Staying on the continent on the same topic, the U.N. team in Malawi, led by resident coordinator Maria Jose Torres Macho, is working to help the Malawian Malawi Malawian authorities uh, to address the multiple effects of the pandemic. COVID-19 infections have risen sharply there in the past months, and the government is restricting travel and public gathering to reduce spread of the virus. To address the shortage, WHO and UNICEF are facilitating the delivery of the remaining 900,000 vaccine doses through COVAX. The agencies are also helping authorities to intensify the screening of travelers, testing and contact tracing. We've provided over 10,000, nearly 10,000 kits. And the UN team is working to promote the prevention and spread of, to promote the prevention 
to promote the prevention and spread of COVID-19 through communication campaigns and community engagement. We've also provided cash transfers to more than 100,000 of the most vulnerable people to cushion the economic impact of the virus. And from South Sudan, ahead of the country's 10th anniversary tomorrow of the historic achievement of independence, the UN peacekeeping mission there said that there is an important opportunity to inject fresh momentum into the peace process to deliver the stability, peace, and prosperity that the country's citizens deserve. The Secretary General's special representative said that tomorrow we are to celebrate this important occasion alongside the people of South Sudan who fought long and hard for their independence and endure great suffering to secure a better life for themselves and future generations. The UN mission says that while significant progress has been made since the signing of the 2018 peace deal, the implementation of the realized agreement is slow and peace remains fragile. With a lack of unified security force, insecurity due to intercommunal fighting, and crime driven by economic deprivation. Mr. Hasem urged the country's political leaders to seize this opportunity to make the hopes and dreams of a decade ago a reality by securing the sustainable peace needed to enable full recovery and development. He stressed the need to fully implement the revitalized peace agreement and for the international community to continue its support for the country. A couple of climate notes uh, this morning. The Secretary General spoke via pre-recorded video message to the first Climate Vulnerable Finance Summit hosted by Bangladesh. Mr. Guterres said that he is inspired by the leadership of the climate vulnerable countries who stand in the front lines of the climate crisis and continue to take climate action even as they continue to suffer the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Secretary General also said the COP26 in Glasgow um, needs to be for it to be a success we need to see the same level of commitment from all countries he noted that developing countries will also need reassurances that their ambitions will be met with financial and technical support solidarity begins with 100 billion dollars he said adding he will emphasize this point to the g20 finance ministers at their meeting in venice uh, tomorrow and today the world meteorological organization and its partners released the first hydro met gap report the report says an estimated 23,000 lives per year could be saved and potential benefits for at least 162 billion dollars per year could be realized by improving weather forecast early warning systems and climate information known as hydro met in a message, the Secretary General said these services are essential for building resilience in the face of climate action. In particular, it noted that small island developing states and least developed countries could benefit for the most improving their basic weather data. He called on donors for the multilateral development banks and private finance institutions to work with vulnerable countries with the development of innovative financial instruments to make this a reality. And the high-level forum for economic and social counsel continued today in a morning session, which exploded, which explored, excuse me, the situation and linkages among the SDG goal 3, 10, 16, and 17. The discussion intensified ways forward towards a more peaceful, equitable, equal, and inclusive societies, including next steps in the health health response to the pandemic, protecting past advances in the areas of health. It also addressed the issues of inequalities within and across countries. This morning also included a short session on how to support local authorities in implementing the SDGs and how to build voluntary local reviews. Also, the President of the Economic and Social Council, Munir Akram, uh, as well as the uh, President of the Ad Hoc ECOSOC uh, the ad hoc exile group on Haiti issued statements uh, and condolences on the death of the Haitian president, Jovenel Moise. Of course, the Security Council president also did the same. Almost done. Uh, a new study released today by the UN Office of Drugs and Crime shows that the devastating impact on COVID-19 has had on victims and survivors of human trafficking. According to the report, traffickers took advantage of the global crisis, capitalizing on people's losses in income, an increased amount of time for both adults and children were spending online. The study found that children are being increasingly targeted by traffickers who are using social media and other online platforms to recruit new victims and profit from increased demand for child sexual exploitation material. It's a tragic report that is worth to be looked at. Um, Quick note from WFP and UNICEF, which said today that at least 80,000 children under the age of five are currently at risk of severe acute malnutrition across the Central African Republic. This is a 29% increase compared to the projections of 2021. 
UN agencies also warned that more than 632,000 people, which represents more than one in eight persons in Central African Republic, will fall into a catastrophic hunger situation between the first week of July and the end of the lean season without urgent action. And uh, also on the issue of food, our global, our colleagues in Rome at the FAO today said that food commodity prices fell in June for the first time in 12 months. FAO food price index was down 2.5% from May, but still 33.9% higher than the same period last year. FAO noted the drop in June reflected uh, declines in the prices of vegetable oil, cereals, and somewhat more moderately, dairy products. According to, latest cross pro excuse me, according to the latest crop prospect and food situation report, which also will be released today, the effects of the pandemic have increased vulnerabilities and heightened existing levels of food insecurity. FAO assesses that globally, 45 countries, including 34 in Africa, nine in Asia, and two in Latin America and the Caribbean, are in need of external food assistance. And lastly, I was asked about the recent demolition of Palestinian housing. And I just want to update that uh, yesterday in the Jordan uh, Valley, uh, representatives from um, uh, representatives from um, OCHA, uh, non-governmental organizations and member states sought to gain access to the community, uh, the community of Huma al Bakia, uh, but were refused uh, by the access refused access by the military while the demolitions were taking place. As of noon today, uh, no assistance had been allowed in, and an OCHA team had entered the community but was requ requested to leave the site by Israeli forces. The Secretary General is uh, indeed. Uh, very deeply concerned about the destruction of uh, Palestinian uh, property in the Bedouin community of Humsa al Bakia in Area C of the occupied West Bank. He reiterates his call on the Israeli authorities to cease demolitions and seizures of Palestinian property in the occupied West Bank. Such actions are contrary to international law and could undermine the chances for establishment of a viable, contiguous Palestinian state. Uh, one second. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. Um, all right. Uh, let's go to Celia. Go ahead. Uh, Stefan, uh, regarding those 80,000 children who are at risk of severe malnutrition, is it because WFP cannot deliver the food? Is it because they lack the money to deliver the food? Is it because of the security? What is the reason? It's a combination, right? Uh, our humanitarian appeals, whether in Central Africa or other places, are severely underfunded. I mean, as you know, the UN humanitarian system works on an as-needed basis, right? There's an emergency, we do an appeal. Uh, we have a bit of reserve cash through the Central Emergency Response response fund, but that's really just a very small, uh, though very important, uh, band-aid. So it's, it's, a, it's a mix of lack of funds and uh, lack of, uh, of security. Yeah. You said that the SG and the DSG are away. No. Who is leading? Yeah. No, the SG is here. in London. The, the SG secretary is here. here. I mean, oh, okay. I, I, I saw a man who looked like him this morning, and okay. he called me. F <laughs> and I, I mean, I didn't ask him where he was, but, uh, you know, he's here. Okay, because okay. I was going to ask who is leading. No, 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 no. that's okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> James and Fetty and then Edie. Okay, um, on the last item you read on the demolitions, uh -huh. you said the Secretary General was deeply concerned. But what does he make of the fact that OCHA representatives were not allowed to attend and then were told to leave. Does he think that is acceptable? No, uh, we, uh, we need to have the access uh, in order to provide humanitarian assistance uh, and to assess the situation uh, as needed. The Secretary General's COVID statement today, the more the virus spreads, the more likely there are to be variants. What is the Secretary General's view then on countries that uh, lift restrictions while cases are still rising? Is that, is that foolish? Look, uh, the issue for the Secretary General uh, is one uh, focused on, on the vaccines, right? Every, um, and this is why he has been calling for uh, equal vaccine access throughout the world for, since the vaccine was 
was rolled out. I mean, he has been warning, I mean, like others, about the, develop, the, the, the health impacts of vaccine nationalism, which is what we're, we're seeing. Um, so his, his message to, uh, to the G20, to those countries that have the, uh, the wherewithal, financial and technical, is to put together a global vaccination plan. You know, we will leave it to, um, to national authorities uh, to figure out what is best for their people. They're accountable to their people. He's taking a much more global picture linked to the vaccines. Feti and then uh, Edi. Thank you, Steph. Uh, I'll follow up on, on uh, James's question uh, regarding the, the vaccines. Uh, you, the Secretary General said the virus is outpacing the vaccine. Uh, where did the almost close to a billion doses that the United States contributed as well as the G7? Sorry, say, say again. Where are the one billion doses that's been contributed to the COVAX and what is the problem on distributing them? Is it logistics? Well, I mean, the, 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 the problem is not on the distribution. I mean, they are being distributed. The problem is on how many doses we have for distribution and how much money COVAX has. Um, UNICEF, I think, is running the COVAX website. It will give you a very clear picture of, of where we are. But we've been, you know, we are working with uh, every member state that is requesting our help on distribution because it is not only, obviously, getting the vaccines from the warehouses to the country. It's on work on, on ensuring that the whole supply chain, the cold chain, the vaccination sites are, are set up. And, you know, I mean, every day today I was reading to you about Malawi, but almost every day I've been giving you updates about what we're doing in, um, in different countries uh, to help with the rollout. Now, some countries are also getting vaccines bilaterally. They're working on that on their own. The ones who are working through COVAX, the UN country teams are assisting. We have been, um, you know, we very much welcome the recent uh, donation by the U.S. of uh, many doses uh, of, of COVAX vaccines. Some of them are already being distributed in, uh, in Latin America and other places. Uh, still on the vaccine before my main question on the, on the GERD. Uh, does the Secretary General support uh, sort of having a vaccine passport as the uh, European Union introduced the, 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 in, in the, July the for issue, the headquarters? The, the issue of the vaccine passport, we will lead, uh, let WHO uh, speak to it. What is important is whatever measures are taking uh, taken in place to not increase the inequality. Uh, and there are also obviously other issues to be taken, with, but that's really a question for WHO. Okay, um, on the GERD, does the Secretary, based on Mr. Anyanga's statement and the Secretary General previous statements uh, on the issue, does the Secretary General uh, support uh, or lean towards having a time limit for the negotiations uh, to continue I, I, among the tripartite? I, I think that, that, that is an issue, uh, I think that is to be my understanding from having read what you've read in the press about the, the draft resolution. That'll be up for member states to, to decide. For, for the Secretary General, it is, in, it is vital that there be a negotiated uh, settlement. Um, he has been fully backing the African Union. Uh, he, we've been offering our help. He's been very involved. Ms. Anderson has also been providing uh, technical advice as needed. You know, whether it's uh, the Nile, the Blue Nile, or the Nile, or any river, uh, they they can be a source of uh, of discord between nations, but they can also be an amazing source of cooperation. And we have seen in other places with major rivers uh, going through many countries where you can find mutually uh, acceptable solutions. It's not a zero sum uh, a zero sum game. Edie. Um, a follow-up on the Secretary General's statement on uh, the 4 million mm -hmm. COVID-19 deaths. Um, he called for an emergency group on vaccines, including all the producers, yeah, the yeah. WHO, financial the institutions, yeah. Yeah. et cetera. Um, is he actually planning to convene a meeting that's going to put all of these groups together to I, do something? We, we are very much looking to the leadership of the G20. We, we need countries that, let's put it simply, that have the cash and have the technical know-how uh, to, uh, to move this forward. Uh, 
I'm going to ask you to put a pin in your questions because we have Helen Lalim uh, on the line. Um, and uh, I don't want to keep her waiting, and I know you're here to hear her. Um, SRSG, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we can see you. Uh, we want to just thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, you have uh, an eager audience here. So I will turn over the floor to you uh, to make some opening remarks. And then we will take, uh, we have time for a few questions. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for being there and for your interest at, at, this, uh, at this difficult time. I, I need to stop for a second because there was a terrible echo. Yeah, we're going to try okay, to. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, we are facing a very serious situation in the country right now. President Jovenel uh, was assassinated in a, uh, in a, in a cowardly and, uh, way uh, just two days ago. We continue to stand with the people of Haiti and the national authorities. Uh, we have um, been working very hard and very closely with all Haitian stakeholders at this, at this moment. Um, we are encouraged by the resilience that they have demonstrated. Uh, the people of Haiti have remained calm in the aftermath of such a national uh, tra tragedy. We uh, continue to, uh, in our outreach efforts, to encourage all national stakeholders to remain united. Our message is that stakeholders need to set aside their differences and to chart a common way forward and overcome this difficult moment in a peaceful manner. Uh, yesterday, you saw that we held uh, meetings with uh, the core group. Yesterday afternoon, the prime minister asked to meet with the core group. Uh, during that uh, meeting, um, he assured us that his government is committed to, um, to dialogue and to uh, continuing uh, with the process to hold elections according to the electoral calendar that was um, released um, just last week. Um, we, uh, if you're following what's going on in Haiti, you saw that uh, a number of arrests have been made, that the police are working very hard to um, arrest uh, the, this commando that uh, entered the compound and uh, attacked the president and the, uh, and the first lady. All efforts must be made to bring these perpetrators to justice. Um, it, is, it is too early to, to, for me to, to comment on, on exactly what went on in, this, in, the, in the circumstances surrounding this abhorrent act of violence. National investigations have started. They will continue and we, uh, we will continue to wait for further developments and to assist as we can. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, SRSG. Uh, we'll start with Edie Letter of Associated Press. Edie. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Alim. On behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association, thank you very much for doing this briefing. Hi, do I hear? Okay. Can, can you hear us? Could you hear me? No. All right. We're, we're, uh, now I can. Now okay. I can. Now I can. Okay, good. Um, I'll speak a little louder. I said thank you on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing. We appreciate it. Um, I have three quick questions. Do you have any idea who these commandos or mercenaries uh, were who killed the president. Um, do we know, is there any idea of who they might be working for, where they were from? Um, and second question, which I'm sure everybody would like to know, where was the president, president's security detail and how come none of them were killed or wounded and thirdly, what are your thoughts about the current interim pre prime minister? 
Should he stay on and organize the election, or should he step aside for some other person or group? Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. I don't know who this commando uh, is. All, all the information that I have, I think, is the same one that you have. The one that it, that is available and that the prime minister informed us of is that this commando with uh, with people sp speaking Spanish and there was some English and uh, posing as a as a DEA force invaded uh, the presidential compound and um, and killed the president. Um, with regard to the other questions that you have asked, these are all questions that we have, um, and, and we're going to have to wait. We're going to have to wait for the investigations to take place, for the police to do their job, and um, and and um, and then we will know what we are pushing for and what the government is very serious about is um, is ensuring that these guys are caught. And that um, and that they are um, and that they are brought to justice. With regard to the current prime minister, Prime Minister Joseph, um, um, is um, is the prime minister of Haiti, and he is such per uh, Article One Forty Nine of the of the current Constitution, of the nineteen eighty seven Constitution, which states that in the event of the death of a president, the current government assumes executive powers and that the prime minister pre presides over this, this group, gives them guidance, and they take Haiti to uh, elections and uh, a new elected president of Haiti. The, uh, there certainly are tensions. There are certainly people on all sides of this issue saying, taking, having different interpretations of Article 149. That's why it's important that dialogue happen and that the Haitian authorities and Haitian stakeholders have a dialogue so that a way forward can be charted, one that gives the people of Haiti the opportunity to decide who their next government is. Thank you. Uh, James Bayes, Al Jazeera. Special Representative, um, there are some suggestions that perhaps this was in part an inside job. Given that, and given the situation in Haiti, is the criminal justice system in Haiti up to this investigation? Do they need international help? In fact, should there even be an international investigation? They are working on this investigation and they have asked for assistance with the investigation. I just came out of a meeting with the Security Council where um, I, the, the, the permanent representative of Haiti mentioned, um, made a request for assistance with the international invest with this investigation from the international um, authorities. And um, and so uh, it is important that these requests be taken seriously. We certainly are prepared as BNU with the with the expertise that we have on board um, to uh, to assist this investigation and to reach out and to call for further expertise as necessary. Thank you, Michelle Nichols Reuters. Hello, thank you so much for this briefing. Um, a question on elections. Can you remind us when Haiti was aiming to hold these elections and are they still on track? Is this going to delay anything? We're in the process of working that now. Uh, the plan is to have uh, the first round of parliamentary and presidential elections take place in, on September 26, with a second round in uh, November. Uh, when the president met, when when the prime minister met with us yesterday, he said the intent is to maintain this calendar, and we are working with the local election authorities and with the um, Matthias Pierre, Haiti's uh, prime min uh, minister for for electoral matters, and uh, to um, to look at the issues and to do our utmost to meet the stage. Thank you, Abdelhamid Sayam. 
Thank you, Madam. Uh, my name is Abdul Hamid Sai. I'm from the Arabic Daily Al Quds Al Arabi. I want to ask you if the, the president was supposed to relinquish his uh, post last February. Had he relinquished his post, we might save the, the country could have been saved of all this trouble. This happened in Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, uh, Zimbabwe, and Algeria when the president refuses to submit to the uh, letter of the Constitution and want to extend his term, that is a uh, symptoms for trouble. I'm not, I'm not condoning what happened, and I condemn his assassination. But isn't that a lesson for all uh, officials to learn from recent history also? Thank you. President Jovenel was elected in 2017 for a five-year term, which was due to expire in February of 2022. And it was in that context that he was working to organize elections and to uh, organize a referendum. Unfortunately, he was killed. And so it is now up to the government of Haiti and the people of Haiti to work so that elections take place uh, and the people of Haiti are able to choose their leaders. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the screen. Uh, Rick Gladstone, New York Times. Rick? Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much for the briefing. Um, what about the, 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 the prime minister that the assassinated president uh, had chosen um, to succeed Mr. Joseph? Um, what do you say to him? Um, you seem to be backing Mr. Joseph's claim to legitimacy as the prime minister of Haiti. Um, there seem to be two prime ministers of Haiti. There, um, Claude Joseph was prime minister of Haiti until a second prime minister would have been sworn in and have picked his government. That did not happen. And so referring to Article 149 of the, of the Constitution of Haiti, Haiti's uh, Prime Minister Joseph has, um, has, has, has explained that uh, the government that is in place under his leadership continues to govern until such time as there is an election. If there are to be any changes in that procedure, it would have to be the result of a political uh, agreement between the parties involved. Where the course that lies ahead for Haiti is a sovereign matter and one to be decided by Haitians. Our role as the UN is to follow the matter and to support as, as appropriate. And what I have heard this prime minister say is that he is open to dialogue and that he is reaching out to parties across all sectors for this dialogue to chart a way forward for Haiti. I would not want to comment any further on this. This is a matter for the Haitians to resolve. Uh, Benno, uh, German Press Agency. Thank you for the briefing. Um, did you get any information about the identities of the uh, four killed and two arrested, or were you given any indication that you might get further information about these people? I'm sure that we will get further information about these people as the investigation uh, proceeds. Um, but uh, as of this time, I do not have any to give you. I know that there have been more arrests. I'm not sure that your numbers are the latest ones. But even the ones that I would offer you, um, what I have now is that in the last 12 hours, um, reports have emerged that four members of the group that raided the presidential residence have been killed by the police while another six are now in police custody. I'm also aware that a larger group of possible perpetrators have taken refuge in two buildings in the city and that they are now surrounded by the police. Thank you. Lenka White, Lenka Mainichi, no, okay. 
Um, we'll go to Benny Avni on the screen. Benny. So the question is, there are uh, reports that there were, that uh, the infiltrators were wearing U.S. uniform. Can you confirm? I can't confirm that. I've heard those reports as well, but I cannot confirm. Okay. Uh, SR Shilim, want to thank you very much uh, for, for taking the time. Uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, Sorry, and what, just one more comment or a question from Edie Letter at the Associated Press. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Hurley. A, a question that I think all of us would like to, I think all of us would like to know. Um, do you believe that the United Nations should uh, send back some kind of a security or peacekeeping operation? under these circumstances, and was this issue discussed um, in your consultations with the Security Council? What we talked about in the Security Council was that Haiti is making a request for security, for additional security assistance, that we should be looking at this assistance. Haiti needs to specify exactly what it is that they're after. And in the meantime, we need to continue to use the security, the technical assistance that we have on ground, maybe to render it more dynamic, so that so that um, so that we can call on additional support. But the key is in the next two weeks. We've got to really get, uh, we really we've got to really be working in in, in in the most effective way to ensure that this investigation moves forward and that the perpetrators of this horrible crime are brought to justice. And that's exactly what we intend to do. Listening, talking to the Haitians, specifying assistance requests, and responding to them as, as is possible. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, and thank, thank you for taking the time to speak to us, and we hope to see you back uh, virtually or in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll go back to the regular programming, uh, unless if you have questions. Yes, Edie and then Benno. Um, my quick question was that Belarus authorities uh, blocked uh, one of the main online media sites today. This is another action in cracking down on the media. Does the Secretary General have any comment? I will check on those reports, because uh, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen it. Uh, but I mean, our, 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 our basic stance for uh, journalists to be able to do their work free of harassment anywhere uh, is unchanged. Abdel Hamid. Just, so, I'm sorry. Just want to say Al Ghatan for Abu Atwan, who's in hunger strike, was released today, and thanks to the statement of the Secretary General. Thank you. Uh, Benno. Um, about cross border, um, it seems that the draft on the table right now contains just one border crossing. I just wanted to know if the Secretary General uh, thinks that this would be a solution that he could live with. Uh, we're, th there's a lot of activity in the Security Council kitchen. Uh, Let's see what comes out. Uh, what we have asked uh, and what we have said is for the, the critical importance of continued uh, cross-border delivery, and obviously, also, if we can, increase cross-line deliveries. OK. Thank you. Uh, Edie, you left your jacket, shawl, or what?